Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, well, we're letting some folks um, get logged in here. Um, I am just making sure we're technically okay. Um, Allie, can you just give me a thumbs up that everyone can see the slide deck okay? Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Provincial HSJCC's webinar. My name is Candace Benna, and I am the Director of Justice Policy here at CMHA Ontario. I also have with me here today Ali Stevenson, who is from the HSJCC Secretariat, supporting um, the webinar today. We will be your hosts and moderators. Um, before we get started and are excited to welcome our special guest, I want to go through some housekeeping items with you. So our webinar is getting started right on time at 12 p.m and we'll conclude today at one. Um, the chat box should be enabled for you to interact. Uh, please feel free to leave comments in there. Um, however, if you do have some questions, just to make it easier, if you could use the Q&A box, that would be great. Um, we will have a dedicated Q&A portion at the end of our webinar. Um, so hopefully be able to hold uh, around 15 to 20 minutes for discussion. The webinar is recorded today, so uh, we will be putting the recording as well as the slides and any resources um, and emailing it to attendees post-webinar, but it'll also be posted on the HSJCC's YouTube page and website, so the, it'll always be up there for everyone. And um, we'll also be holding a few minutes at the end just to um, put in a short survey. You know, we're always looking to hear folks' feedback on our webinar topics and how we um, design our, our knowledge exchange opportunities. So please um, take the time if you can to fill that out. We'll also email it uh, in our follow-up email for anyone who didn't have an opportunity to do that. And just quickly, uh, for those who may be new to the Human Services and Justice Coordinating uh, Committee Network, um, the HSJCC is an interministerial inter-collaborative uh, uh, network comprised of 38 local committees, um, 14 regional committees, and one provincial HSJCC. These are voluntary collaborations between health, human services, community mental health, and addiction organizations, and all of our partners from the justice sector. Um, for more information, of course, about HSJCC, if you're interested, uh, please visit our website. And I am just going to stop. Um, sharing here. We can see everyone. Wonderful. So it now gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce to you our guest speaker, Brandy Tannenbaum. Uh, Brandy is a risk manager who works in the injury prevention as the injuries prevention coordinator in the Tory Trauma Program at Sunnybuck Health uh, Sciences here in Toronto. Brandy will be uh, speaking today about uh, Sunnybrook's uh, program, Breaking the Cycle of Violence with Empathy, also known as BRAVE. Thank you for being here, Brandy, and I'm gonna turn it over to you to get things started. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here and uh, very happy to see uh, that other people showed up. Um, okay, so give me one second to share my, share my screen, get myself situated. All right. Um, you can see my screen, yes? Beautiful, all right. Um, again, thank you so much um, for allowing me the, the time to share our program. We're very proud of our program and uh, just delighted with the opportunity to be able to share it um, uh, at this uh, provincial um, uh, webinar. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, being a new member of the HSJCC in North York and um, and, and uh, getting acquainted with um, uh, how that uh, network uh, operates and um, I'm learning so much uh, as we go along. Um, I, I just want a couple caveats. One is um, generally I, I give like very um, um, uh, casual presentations like this. So I'm going to uh, try to talk as normally as possible and not not read too much from notes. Um, but also uh, I, I am at home, um, if, despite my screen, that might uh, be a little, somewhat misleading. And I have a little white terrier behind me. And I don't know if anybody else is at home with a little white terrier, but you know what that means. Um, that at any point, should a butterfly be circling within 50,000 kilometers of my house, the dog may erupt. Um, so I will um, embarrassingly try to navigate that, uh, that space. Um, <laughs> uh, so please bear with me uh, in these uh, fun times when we're doing webinars now rather than meeting in person. Um, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to return back uh, shortly to my um, my slide, and I'm just going to move some things around on my screen. But let's first start with um, 
a land acknowledgement, if that's all right. So um, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center is located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inui, and Métis people. We acknowledge that this territory is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. And um, although I am not a person of African descent, I'm committed to continually acting in support and in solidarity with Black communities seeking freedom and reparative justice in light of the history and ongoing legacy of slavery that continues to impact Black communities in Canada. As part of this commitment, I would also like to acknowledge that not all people came to these lands as migrants and settlers. Specifically, I wish to acknowledge those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly those brought to these lands as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. In support of the hospital's ongoing efforts to confront anti-Black racism, I pay tribute to those ancestors of African origin and descent. All right, so the presentation, let's get into it. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to share our, our program. It's still, I would say, in its toddler phase um, at four years old. Um, the, the, and, and today I'll be talking about the role and the development of, of our program. And what, what does it mean to be brave? Um, for clinicians in the hospital, in our trauma program in particular, it means facing life and death situations with precision and skill. And for me as an injury prevention coordinator, and perhaps for you and your roles with agencies and government, it will mean finding the best pathways to support vulnerable people in their time of need and support long-term positive outcomes. Our program started back in January 2019 when our um, medical director, Dr. Avery Nathan, stopped by our Center for Injury Prevention office and asked, do you want to start a hospital-based violence intervention program? And without hesitation, I answered, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then I quickly Googled um, to see what I'd gotten myself into, because up until that point, um, the Center for Injury Prevention had been focused uh, almost entirely on primary prevention. And uh, we had we've always had a youth focus with a program called Prevent Alcohol and Risk Related Trauma in Youth or PARTY program. And um, uh, uh, we hadn't we hadn't uh, dipped our toes in the tertiary prevention space, which is what um, a hospital based violence intervention program is. And so um, uh, there, it, it required a good amount of um, learning and uh, collaborating and um, uh, meeting with uh, other centers uh, in the United States and, uh, and and developing a program that met the needs of our Toronto population. And so here we are. Uh, fast forward four years. We're very proud to share our program um, called Brave. So I'll give you a little bit of background information and where the program comes from and why programs like this are important. Um, the City of Toronto has seen an increase in homicide and shootings in recent years. And as frontline clinicians and injury pre um, prevention practitioners, we see the effects of community violence every day. At Sydney Brook, we have seen an increase um, now to, and I've updated this, this slide in particular recently. So it was 17%, um, it's now 19% of our trauma activations and an increase from 150% to 163% in weekly rates from just under three to averaging over um, seven and a half uh, cases per week. So we were seeing that and, um, and that was distressing to our clinicians who were seeing patients coming back time and time again with similar and escalating injuries. Um, so for many years, the city of Toronto has seen an upward trend uh, with shooting incidents uh, doubling. However, in the past four years, we have seen some stability. So from 2020 to 2024, we've seen some stability. And I'm going to say that uh, we can probably account for the good work that's happening in the city to help reduce um, gun violence. And, um, um, and there's so much more attention um, being focused in that particular area and a strong um, um, uh, approach and strategy uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit. Nonetheless, the numbers are concerning and it's not just a Toronto problem. Um, firearm related violent crime represents a small proportion of crimes in Canada um, among both police reported crime and crimes reported by Canadians and victimization surveys. Uh, but firearm related violent crimes represent a large share of the most serious crimes, such as homicide, attempted murder, um, um, robberies, aggravated assaults and gang related crime. Uh, police services in Canada reported about 14,000 incidents of firearm related violent crime in 2022, and that's roughly 1400 more than the previous year. 
And so we've got some stats here to look at. The rate of firearm uh, related violent crime has increased um, by 8.9% from the year before. Um, uh, the increase uh, is mainly attributed to significant increases in Ontario, New Brunswick and British Columbia. And all the provinces and territories have seen the rate of firearm related violent crime increase since that low point in 2013. And the largest increases were recorded in the Northwest Territories, Saskatchewan, Yukon and New Brunswick. So this is not a Toronto um, specific problem. Uh, we do see um, uh, large increases of um, gun related violence in uh, our larger metropolitan areas, but also in other areas that we probably don't think too much about. And not only is this a Canadian issue, but this is also um, a global issue. It's not specific to any one area. Um, uh, um, youth violence and gun violence um, disproportionately affects uh, young people. It's the fourth leading cause of death under the age of 29. And when it's not fatal, um, violence has a serious and often lifelong impact on a person, their family, their friends, and their community, that whole ecosystem. We also know that the recidivism rate for gun-related injuries, for violent injuries in general, is higher than other mechanisms of injury. And so that means that somebody who comes in um, uh, with one um, gunshot injury is likely, very likely, to come back with a, a subsequent injury. Um, and we see that as well in, in, in some of the other mechanisms of injury, like um, older adults um, and falls. But with gun violence, um, it's a specifically a young person's issue. So let's go back to Toronto and, um, and our program specifically. Uh, it's important to us in injury prevention that our programs are data-based. Um, and uh, while Toronto is considered one of the safest cities in the world, we also know that violent injury like stabbing and gun shootings are not equally distributed across the city. And these are the hotspots, the communities where we've seen higher rates of our patients coming to Sunnybrook. So you can see the clustering on the west side and the east side of the city. The little blue star there in the middle is where Sunnybrook is located. It also happens to be one of the most affluent communities in the entire country. And so um, as part of our program development, uh, we looked at these postal codes to understand the geographic spread. These are the top 10 areas that were identified in our analysis. And we see more of our patients um, with gunshots and stabbing injuries coming from these areas. Um, this includes Black Creek, Rexdale, um, Malvern. It's important for us to know where the patients are coming from so that we can effectively build relationships and patient pathways in these areas as a priority. And I will speak more to these geographic areas um, towards the end of the presentation, but just keep this, this map in mind. So we've, we've recently been accepted as a full program in the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention, otherwise known as the HAVI. This is an American uh, organization, um, an umbrella organization that leads the network for um, hospital-based violence intervention programs. And we were very um, honored to be included amongst the, um, the other programs that are accepted. And, um, and the hobby identifies violence as an epidemic that disproportionately affects young people, especially young people of color. And in the midst of the pandemic and, and pro our program development, the conversation about systemic racism shifted in society and in healthcare. And we acknowledge the intersection of race, violence, poverty, and health outcomes. We understand that many violently injured individuals have extreme distrust in the mainstream institutions that have failed them in the past, including the healthcare system. And so that is important in our program development. Um, once we got our program underway, we looked at um, who our patients were. In the healthcare system in 2020, we did not have good uh, data to help us understand the identity of our patients. We, um, and so we had to uh, build that data ourselves. Uh, we understand that more than 50% of our program participants in the BRAVE program are of Black, African, or Caribbean descent, while about 30% are Asian, Latin American, or Middle Eastern. Again, this helps us in our program development to understand who our patients are and how we can serve them in the best way possible. What we've also done simultaneously in our uh, Center for Injury Prevention is understand more broadly who our trauma population is. And so we've looked at increments of five years of trauma data um, on three occasions. And we've uh, also overlaid our trauma data with the um, social determinants of health uh, using the Ontario Marginalization Index. 
And, and what we've learned is that those patients who are violently injured have more social needs like housing, employment, financial instability than our other um, mechanisms of injury like motor vehicle collision, patients, falls and self-harm. Um, and, and again, that helps us as we build out this program and as we um, create the argument for why this program is needed is even though going back to our original data that about just under 20% of our trauma population um, is, is violently injured, um, th th that 20% has the highest social needs. And so creating a program that is um, working directly with the most vulnerable patients is tremendously important um, in our equity work. Okay, so at this point, you're probably saying, what the heck is a hospital-based violence intervention program? <laughs> And so let's get into that. So these programs are designed to understand the underlying characteristics um, and risk factors uh, um, uh, that patients experience to develop rapport, to build trust, to connect patients to services in their community. Um, but it's more than just a system navigation. It's, it's walking with them on their healing journey. It's the fundamental shift to acknowledge that trauma does not define a person and it doesn't limit their potential. And in this way, we aim to break the cycle of violence with empathy. So BRAVE, like other hospital-based violence intervention programs, are multidisciplinary programs that combine the efforts of medical staff with trusted community-based partners to provide safety, planning, services, and trauma-informed care to violently injured people, many of whom are boys and men of color. The hobby, that organization that I mentioned earlier, recommends that any hospital treating over 100 assaults, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, or other violence-related injuries per year through their emergency department or trauma activations should establish a hospital-based violence intervention program. And they recommend that public health research on risk and protective factors for violence injury inform the standards um, of that trauma center practice. And this is an intentional reframing or repositioning of the hospital within the community. And when it's done successfully, can create opportunities for genuine collaboration across systems to improve those health outcomes that we're so desperately trying to achieve. So um, I'm speaking directly to you. If you are working in a community where you know that there is violence um, and, the, and, and, and collaborating with your hospital and healthcare system, understanding the, the numbers, um, asking about the data, um, this can point you in a direction to see where you are in your community and if a program like this is necessary. So let's talk about our BRAVE program. And here is a picture, uh, Dr. Avery Nathans is uh, here on the, the right, my right. This is um, Alana Perlman. She's one of our trauma social workers. And this is Michael Lewis, and he is our first um, case manager for BRAVE. And this truly is a collaboration um, from our medical practice through our social work team and um, to our BRAVE team working um, to break down the walls between the hospital, the care that's provided there by both our clinicians and our social work team and how we help uh, patients reintegrate into community uh, post-injury, post-discharge. So BRAVE officially launched at the end of September 2020, and you might remember there was some other stuff going on at that time. Uh, this program is a testament to the courageous and thoughtful leadership of Dr. Nathans and our trauma services manager, Corey Friedman, um, to share and advocate for this program concept to the top of our system and throughout. And every step of the way, our senior leadership has been incredibly supportive and enthusiastic of this program. Our, our mission, goals, objectives uh, for this program are very similar to any other community or hospital violence intervention program. And what's important here is the shift in a hospital trauma program applying a public health model. And you can see that in our principles. We use a public health approach to violence prevention, recognizing the modifiable risk factors, including the social determinants of health and systemic racism. The goal of, of BRAVE is not to prevent people from coming into the hospital with that first injury. This is a tertiary prevention program. We want to reduce the risk factors and increase the protective factors for subsequent violence. So once somebody comes into the hospital with, an, with a violent injury, they are, as I've mentioned before, at a very high risk for subsequent injury. If we can intervene in that moment in time when they are with us at the hospital, we have a better chance to reduce those risk factors. 
Our mission is to promote positive alternatives to violence in order to reduce retaliation, criminal involvement, and re-injury among youth injured by violence. And our objectives are to facilitate referrals to community services, link patients and their families to mental health supports, and to support medical follow-up for physical injury. Brave uses a teachable moment approach with a culturally competent case manager. We have two now who meet with patients in hospital as soon as reasonably possible. And our case managers develop a rapport with the patients and their families and help to identify their short and medium and long-term needs and goals. Uh, patients are connected with the case managers for up to a year post hospital discharge, but we're, we're pretty loose on that. Um, some patients will need more beyond that year and some, some will need less. So it depends on what protective factors they have uh, in their own personal ecosystems. And um, yeah, you can see we've got our injury incident. So that's where we start the program uh, with the teachable moment that follows. There's the recovery, which is physical, mental, spiritual, psychological, all of those pieces wrapped into one, and then empowering them um, to reintegrate back into a community. That could mean going back to school, um, 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 finding employment, um, uh, lots of things depending on uh, their personal goals and aspirations. So our case, our first case manager, Michael, enrolled the first brave patient on September 29th, 2020. And we spent um, uh, a, a lot of that first year uh, creating, adding, changing things like uh, safety and, and COVID protocols. We developed um, data management processes, screening tools, referral pathways, and extensive engagement with community agencies. Um, it's been a, a tremendously uh, challenging and hugely rewarding um, uh, program. Um, overall, uh, 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 since uh, 2020, we've enrolled 226 patients. Uh, Michael and Elena combined have supported uh, more than uh, 1,400 um, home and community visits that can also be at rehab centers. Um, they've identified more than uh, 977 risk factors, and we use the City of Toronto definitions uh, for risk factors. They've made more than 850 service referrals. And uh, what's really important is that none of this work could be done with the existing resources in our trauma program in the, in the healthcare system. Um, much of this work was also done in the midst of the pandemic when many other community services moved to online delivery and still some have not come back to full capacity. And so you might be wondering, so what's, so what? <laughs> so what does a program like this do? And what we wanted to do after our first year of uh, program delivery was evaluate how well we were meeting our stated goals and objectives, um, how well we were sticking to our plan in program delivery. And, um, and we worked with York University and the Youth Recs program through their social work school um, to evaluate BRAVE from that process perspective and to uncover the mechanisms within the program that underpin the success we were seeing. Um, additionally, we had a master's student who was evaluating our intake and our post-program risk factor changes. And so in this mixed methods evaluation, uh, we learned that participating in BRAVE can reduce a patient's risk factors for violence by 37%. And we also heard directly from staff, from parents, and most importantly, from the participants. So uh, we were able to do some of those qualitative interviews. And this is some of the feedback we got. So this is from uh, program and hospital staff. Um, I, and I, I think a lot of people feel that they can relate um, to the case manager in a lot of ways. Um, but like just in his presence, he's so open and friendly and engaging uh, that I think he's very good at developing rapport but really quickly with people and especially people who may have walls up. So I've definitely seen a benefit to that patients uh, who like won't give me the time of day. Um, so that is a staff person who has historically seen that uh, oftentimes um, patients who've experienced violence are not responsive to our traditional um, um, uh, clinicians uh, in the hospital. Um, and uh, uh, sometimes, um, you know, and, and, and that's why these programs exist is because we need to have the right people at the right time in the right place um, to help these patients recognizing um, the, the trauma that they're coming through the door with. 
this is from a, a, one of our youth participants who said, I didn't know I'd be more motivated to go back to work. It's the encouragement. It's someone pushing me, someone always checking up on me, someone always saying, you good. What are you trying to do in the next five years? And another one that says, honestly, I'm doing well now, you know, I'm doing this training. I'm staying out of trouble. I moved out of the place I was living before, cut off ties with stupid friends that were causing and jeopardizing my freedom and well-being. So it helped me a lot with learning to focus on myself more and putting myself before anything. And yeah, taking care of all of my issues I have in life. So it really helped me out a lot. And we have we have many examples of uh, uh, um, statements from parents, from participants who are just incredibly grateful to have somebody who understands them deeply, understands the challenges that they're experiencing. And uh, it comes with them, walks with them on this journey of recovery. And, and, and um, you know, to, to specify when somebody is treated at Sunnybrook or at St. Mike's or at any of the trauma centers, they are being treated for the most severe and significant of injuries. Um, it's not, um, you know, a scrape or a bump or a bruise. These are catastrophic life altering injuries. Um, they can include traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, multi body system injuries. The care for these patients is specialized and, and we have, um, you know, we only have um, 11 uh, lead trauma hospitals in Ontario that provide the specialized care that's required for um, gunshot and stabbing patients. Um, and, and so uh, it's, um, yeah, I lost my train of thought on that one. <laughs> A little tangent, let's get back to <laughs> the presentation. Um, partnerships, let's talk about partnerships. So we've been able to make some amazing partnerships through this program. And oftentimes we find that community organizations um, have never heard from their hospital partners. Um, and, and they often wonder like, what, what is happening in the hospital? Like before a, a program like Brave existed, somebody would be uh, um, injured. They would be treated in the hospital. They'd be sent home uh, without supports. And, and then they might find their way to an agency in the city um, that could could help them, um, but you know that's that takes time and it's not coordinated. And uh, and and so these agencies have been absolutely thrilled to hear about this program and understand that we want to be a partner in caring for these patients and creating pathways much earlier in the healing process, uh, so that when somebody leaves the hospital, they are connected with our case manager, who is also going to introduce them to other um, agencies uh, to help support them and their community reintegration. It's particularly uh, important that we're able to support their physical uh, recovery as well. And we we have um, a, a trauma outpatient clinic for patients to come back and meet with um, all manner of, uh, it's a very multidisciplinary clinic. Um, uh, we have um, a family doctor now for those that don't have family doctors, um, uh, uh, PT, uh, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, uh, pain management, social work. Um, so we've got, and, and there's more, and we've got just this beautiful complement of um, clinicians that can help support the patient's physical recovery, as well as some of that social recovery. So we're really creating this wraparound approach where our, our case managers are attached to the patients, we'll take them to the clinic if needed. We, um, and I'll speak shortly about some funding we have to help bring people back to the hospital, again, considering the geographic spread of Toronto and how hard it is to get to a place like Sunnybrook. And... Um, yeah, so uh, back to partnerships. Um, we have uh, created some incredible partnerships. The most important, of course, is uh, through the City of Toronto, who has been funding this program since 2020. And without their uh, support um, financial, we would not be able to deliver uh, BRAVE. It is not a high cost program, um, but it's also not a program necessarily that should be funded by a municipality. This is also a health-based program. And so we struggle between um, our, our funders in terms of uh, how a program like this can be funded. Ultimately, um, is it uh, a public health program functioning in a hospital or is it a hospital program that functions in community? Is it something in between and how does that get funded effectively? We are embedded in the Safe TO strategy. Um, which is a 10 year um, uh, community safety and well-being plan, um, as well as our uh, uh, our friends at uh, um, Unity Health and St. Mike's and the Thrive Program. 
Uh, we have partnered with Humber River Hospital and Scarborough Health Network. So again, referring back to that map and where our patients are coming from, we want to ensure that we are working with our community health partners um, in the areas where we are seeing patients come to Sunnybrook. Sometimes they get repatriated back to these hospitals, um, and sometimes they get diverted from these hospitals to Sunnybrook. But nonetheless, we want to create um, a continuous pathway of support um, for the community members um, in, in these regions of uh, the city. Uh, we also have an informal partnership with sick kids um, to help uh, support younger patients um, that experience violence and, and violent related injuries. We're collaborating with Toronto Community Housing on BRAVE, ensuring that through their um, crisis response programs and their violence intervention programs that we have uh, collaboration and again, providing that wraparound service to uh, the, the same people, we're serving the same people um, and we just want to make sure that there's a continuity of care as we do that. Uh, we're also working with them to deliver a program called Stop the Bleed, which provides bleeding control education to the public. That's a secondary prevention program in the event that somebody experiences an injury with, with catastrophic bleeding, um, that the, the public um, is, is well equipped to manage that injury uh, before um, EMS can arrive on scene. We've also partnered with uh, Brands for Canada to deliver new clothing to brave patients and their families. Uh, one thing about coming to the trauma center is that all of your clothes are going to be cut off you immediately. And uh, it might be your favorite pair of jeans. It might be your only pair of jeans. And we want to make sure that we're able to provide um, new clothing to our patients who need it um, while they're in hospital. And then when they're out of hospital, we're able to provide them with clothing that they can use for um uh, job interviews, and sometimes they have funerals to go to. Um, they have life events that they need to go to, and they they want to look the best they can for these um, these events. Um, we have also partnered with Focus, um, which is um, a situation table that um, many of you are familiar with. Um, and these situation tables are are, are set up across the city, um, and they are also set up across the country. Um, and in different communities in Ontario as well. A collaboration in Toronto with United Way, Toronto Police and the City of Toronto to support people who are deemed to be at risk. And I mentioned that we have a little bit of funding. So in a, in, in, through that partnership with the City of Toronto and a federal grant that the city has received, um, BRAVE has distributed $50,000 in the past year with funds that are dedicated to stabilizing individuals and their families that are completely overwhelmed by the expenses associated with a traumatic injury. If you just consider the, the cost for um, hospital parking alone, the transportation to and from appointments, the medical supplies that somebody might need, uh, mobility devices, uh, food, rent support, bills, uh, school supplies, groceries, and more. Um, oftentimes these are young individuals that are in hospital and a parent is going to be at the bedside for as, as, as much as they can be, which means they're not working. And, um, and so uh, we already know that finances are tight within this, within this population. Um, so we're able to use this fund to help offset some of those expenses that the, uh, the families and the individuals are experiencing. And, um, and these are immediate, these are crisis needs, um, and, uh, uh, and, and we're so grateful that we're able to do that. This is exactly how a program like this should be funded or it should be operating. It should have some funding to help with the, to offset these financial costs um, given the population that we're working with. Um, this is a time limited uh, fund um, and uh, we are um, very <laughs> apprehensive about what happens uh, following the end of this grant. We're, we're very hopeful that the city will be able to secure additional funding going forward. But, um, but without it, um, getting people back to the hospital to go to the trauma recovery clinic for their appointments becomes very difficult. Um, um, sometimes we're able to Uber people to their physio appointments or again back to the hospital for their clinic appointments. Um, they simply don't have the funding or, you know, the, the mom or dad who was taking time off work to sit with them at their bedside isn't able to take more time off to drive them to their appointments. Uh, otherwise, they can't pay their rent or they can't pay their bills. And, um, and then we have bigger problems. So where we can use this type of funding to support uh, the patients and their immediate physical recovery needs, um, we will do so. We're also able to use the funding 
for some of those longer term goals. So we've been able to help uh, a young person um, to get their real estate license. We've helped a young person to apply for um, a university program. Um, they've, they've, they've changed their trajectory and they want to become a social worker. And uh, we're so honored to be able to help that person uh, on their journey. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that one day they may become a, a brave case manager as well. So let's talk about the shift because the brave is all about breaking down the silos and reimagining what prevention care looks like for violently injured patients. So the current approach and what we've seen that induced the need for this program is this idea that violently injured patients are difficult to care for and are probably gang involved. And our, the brave approach is that the trauma of violence has symptoms that can be recognized. The current approach and what it again induced our program is that the clinicians might feel their job is to care for the patient's physical wounds. And the brave approach suggests that a trauma-informed approach can shift the patient-practitioner relationship. And that current approach that it's not the responsibility of the hospital to do public health work. The brave approach tells us that hospitals are the ideal setting to initiate early intervention in collaboration with public health and partner agencies. And so our next steps are to secure funding. <laughs> that, is, that is job number one. The City of Toronto has allocated additional funding for brave and hospital-based violence intervention programs as part of the SafeTO plan. That was in the 2023 budget. Um, so we're very quickly coming to the end of that uh, budget cycle. Um, the city continues to advocate, as does the hospital, um, to, uh, to government on sustainable funding. Um, and expanding the program across the, the, the city to other hospitals, as well as um, across the province. Uh, again, Toronto is not the only um, uh, city that needs these types of programs. Um, every hospital should have these types of programs without question. And um, I have come to the end of the, um, the formal uh, presentation. Um, I've got a list of references, but um, they can be shared at a later time. Um, and my email's here, so I'll leave that up. And I'm um, happy to entertain questions. I just want to say, while people are typing in their questions, uh, thank you, Brandy. I, I learned a lot about the BRAVE program uh, today and just how important it is. And I'm hopeful that other areas that are experiencing, you know, that high number of, of folks uh, in, in trauma centers may be able to look at developing similar programs that are so important for communities. I was really struck by a number of things you said around trauma does not define a person or their their outcomes uh the fact that this is really taking that public health approach um and i thought it you know it was it, really interesting to see um you said i may not be able to build that relationship with someone but some of our case managers are able to build that report they they have um, that connection to the community and they're also you know coming from that culturally competent um perspective. So I thought that was so important, especially for those that are looking at, you know, maybe developing uh, their own programs and looking at um, how do we build that, those connections, especially in systems where, like you said, youth may have faced some sort of discrimination or systemic racism, and we need to kind of break those barriers to, to see how we can build those connections. So just kudos to the work that you're doing. And, and thank you again for the presentation. And we'll see if some questions come through. Great. Thanks. We have two questions. Um, so the first was, what has been the recidivism rate? That is an excellent question that I would very much like to answer. So that that's one of our key research goals is to understand recidivism. And we are flummoxed a bit by the, um, the way the data is captured in the healthcare system. It does not capture recidivism well. So to access that requires a, a big chunk of funding to, um, to be able to retrieve through um, um, the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences um, and the the data pool. Um, and so uh, it is our plan. And it's a plan that we've had since the beginning. Um, and it's certainly one of our goals generally for the Center for Injury Prevention. We have a main focus um, now in our strategic plan on recidivism and understanding that and how we can um, how we can reduce recidivism uh, in trauma, the trauma population at large. Uh, so it's it's a great question. 
And we also needed the time to build um, uh, to, a, to a certain number of patients. So we couldn't evaluate recidivism with five patients. We really need to have a good, a good cohort. So I'm hoping um, that we're now over 200 patients, that we are close to that point where we can start to look at a comparison between 200 patients that have gone through BRAVE and 200 that haven't. And even still, it's going to be a very small um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, study size, sample size. So uh, it's on the radar. So I think we're going to start asking those questions in, in a big way around trauma and also specifically around BRAVE. Uh, we want to just make sure that when we do get that funding to do that study, that we have enough power um, with the, the, the sample size to, um, to make good sense of, of the information. But that it's an absolute key. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is, have you done an ROI case for the funding? Ah, good, excellent question. So there is good, um, uh, good research in the States where they've tried to do that. And what's really interesting, and this is like why the sort of interministerial approach is important, because what we're doing in the healthcare system probably won't benefit the healthcare system it will benefit other systems. It's going to benefit justice. It's going to benefit social services. Um, it's going to benefit, um, you know, the ability for people to work and contribute to the, the tax pool. Um, I'm, I'm very, I'm very um, interested in, in, in how we can uh, capture the benefits of this program um, in a way that makes sense to all of the ministries and not just the Ministry of Health, that this is, it is a health-based program, but that will have benefits in um, in the other uh, areas of society. So that the, when we were initially developing the program, that was one of the questions was, how much are we going to save? And um, will we see savings in the healthcare system? And certainly we could do those calculations, but because of the impact in so many of the other areas, it becomes a very unwieldy uh, study to, to complete. So we looked at some of those studies that were done in the States and that was exactly their, um, you know, their discussion points and the conclusion was like, it's just, it's, it, it's a very difficult calculation to come up with. Um, but we could, we could come up with like some dollars and cents that it might save the healthcare system. This is how much it costs to treat a violently injured patient. And this is, you know, this is where we would see a savings. Um, we could do that calculation, uh, but it's not going to tell the whole picture. Um, another attendee asked, what is the annual budget for the program? Yeah, good question. So our funding um, from the city, I believe, is about $200,000, and that covers the two case managers, um, the administrative cost of the uh, program delivery. Um, uh, they travel across the city um, a, a bazillion kilometers each year, um, so covering the cost for, for transportation. Um, it's, it's a very low investment uh, for a program like this for the impact that it has. If you consider the, again, the ROI, the tens of thousands of dollars to support one violently injured patient. And if you think about the cost associated with one violently injured patient with a spinal cord injury or traumatic brain injury, the cost of the program is covered by that one patient. I think you've kind of touched on this, but um, an attendee said you have a great program in place. Is there a concern for funding long term? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <they're in. laughs> yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's the, that's the piece that keeps me up at night is, as how do we keep a program like this running? Um, and, uh, so we've activated our foundation to help with, with funding. Um, we're not eligible for a lot of grants because it's a hospital program. So a lot of, a lot of grant programs exclude hospitals from applying, even though, there is no healthcare funding for injury prevention in 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 hospitals or in trauma care. Um, we we have a, we basically run a bare bones uh, operation um, uh, with a little bit of, of revenue generation from our party program or our stop the bleed program, uh, but certainly not enough to cover our costs. So Sunnybrook is a tremendous supporter of our injury prevention work and has been since 1986, since uh, the Center for Injury Prevention started, and um, and so we are grateful to have. Uh, um, you know, the, the funding from the hospital to to deliver programs, but this program has some specific costs associated with it. 
uh, hard cost, um, not just in, in, in staff time. Um, so yeah, how we, how we sustain this program um, through funding, uh, grant funding um, that we might be able to find or foundation funding. Um, and we're really hoping at the end of the day that, that the, the government will see that these programs are beneficial and do have cost savings. Um, but more than that, that they can help people to, um, you know, realign their, their goals and, and find pathways to, um, to meeting some of those goals, whether that's going back to school or, you know, addressing the mental health associated with the complex post-traumatic stress disorder, um, that we can help somebody live a, a healthy life and, and contribute in a meaningful way to their community and to society and their families. Um, you know, that's, that's the argument that I'd like to make, but I know that there's no dollars and cents attached to that one, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's by, by compare. So we always joke at the hospital that we are a rounding error. Like the hospital will spend more money on toilet paper than, than on injury prevention. That's just the, the, the fact of it. It's, it's a, a very large institution. Um, so yeah, like our spoons or, um, cups or, like everything has got a bigger budget than, than injury prevention and, and, and brave as a rounding error um, in terms of that larger um, um, uh, money for, for funding the, the, the healthcare that's delivered through Sunnybrook. So um, I'm hopeful that um, because of the support of our senior leaders um, and the support of our community and uh, the city, the partners that, um, that we'll be able to find uh, sustainable funding and, yeah, and and ideally, th this is a hospital-based program that 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 fits very nicely into um, the healthcare objectives uh, for Ontarians generally, as well as other ministry objectives too. I think they can just team up and support these programs at large across the province. <laughs> um, kind of in line with that, is Brave being done in any of the other eleven trauma hospitals in Ontario? Yes. So. Um, uh, St. Mike's has started their program called Thrive. Uh, so uh, Toronto has three lead trauma hospitals, uh, St. Mike's at Unity Health, uh, Sunnybrook and Sick Kids for Pediatric Trauma. Um, and uh, we're, we're very fortunate that the lead at Thrive is uh, uh, Dr. Carolyn Snyder, who started um, EdVip in Winnipeg um, a number of years ago uh, before she moved back to Toronto. Um, and EdVip is a, an emergency department based violence intervention program running out of Winnipeg. And um, yeah, so Thrive is a, a, a very similar program that's running out of the emergency department at St. Mike's. Um, that is the, these are the only two programs in the country that are, that are running. Yeah, we need more of these. There, there needs to be, and 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 a, and a also a broader approach to violence intervention in the uh, in the healthcare settings, in in emergency departments and trauma programs at large. So while we're scratching the surface with Brave, we also have intimate partner violence and other forms of violence that also need attention. And, and what a program like Brave is demonstrating is that tertiary prevention is a very important part and a and a long missed part of injury prevention strategies in, in the healthcare system. Um, we have not been paying attention to tertiary uh, prevention in injury um, care, in trauma care. Um, if you go to the emergency department with a, a, a TIA, a mini stroke or a heart attack, uh, you will be referred to a prevention clinic. Before you leave, you'll have a referral to a prevention clinic. But if you go into a hospital other than Sunnybrook or St. Mike's with a gunshot wound, you're going to get patched up and sent home with no referral. If you break your leg, if you fall off your bike, you're going to get sent home without a referral to a prevention clinic. Um, and what we know with recidivism research is that the people who come into the hospital with injuries are at the highest risk for a subsequent injury. So why we have this disconnect between prevention work in, in injury and, and the rest of um, the medical system is perplexing. And, and that's one of the things that the Center for Injury Prevention is planning to tackle in our new strategic plan, is this focus on tertiary prevention and sort of leveling the playing field. So those that are injured and come into our emergency departments and trauma centers uh, deserve um, the same prevention care that they're getting uh, in stroke prevention and diabetes prevention and heart disease prevention, cancer prevention. Um, an attendee said, uh, amazing program. Is there any opportunity to volunteer within Brave? 
slash how would you go about oh, doing that? <laughs> good question. I, at, at this point, I'm not sure. That question has come up a couple of times. So I think we're going to have to probably look at that. And I think um, I think we might find some opportunities for volunteering through like social um, social service worker uh, diploma programs or social work programs. Um, you know, how do we train our next group of, of case managers? So should a hospital um, somewhere else in Ontario want to start a program, who, who would be trained to do this work? And so I think we need to start um, developing some, some leadership pathways so that people can be trained to do this work. This is very specialized work that people have not had the opportunity to do before. So there are, there are lots of opportunities to do violence intervention work in, in, uh, the, in the community. Um, but there are very few opportunities to do this work in the hospital. And there is a, there's a, you know, there's a good, um, you know, like if you've done violence intervention work in the community, you're a great candidate to do this work in the hospital, but there are some nuances in the hospital that are quite different than, um, than working in the community once somebody has recovered from injury. So, you know, those initial stages of, of injury recovery in the ICU in critical care units um, in the in the trauma ward, those require um, you know some good learning, and uh, our case managers have had to sort of navigate that space um, and 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 you know chart new new territory um, that they wouldn't have learned about in um, you know in their education learning or in the work that they've done in the community. So I think um, that's probably where we would um, look for some volunteers, um, maybe on the fundraising side. <laughs> be helpful too. I think generally just spreading the word about programs like this um, would be wonderful. Um, another area that we're looking to expand on is uh, support for parents of, of young people who have been injured through violence. How do we support the parents through this experience? Um, we understand that that violence is an injury that affects the entire family unit. And, um, you know, if, if uh, um, yeah, so if somebody has ideas or expertise in uh, facilitating um, um, uh, uh, support groups, that would be wonderful. That is something that we're embarking on shortly. I think like along those lines, another question came in about um, how do case managers ensure they are maintaining credibility with clients while also noting there's sometimes information that police are wanting after shooting, for example, or applying pressure uh, for among workers or patients? Ah, okay, repeat the question. That's a big one. How do case managers ensure they are maintaining their credibility with clients while also noting there sometimes is information that police are wanting after a shooting or applying pressure among workers or patients? Um, the, the credibility is, is established um, and maintained in the report and the relationship that they build with the patients. Um, we have been very uh, protective of our program and um, police services is aware of our program. Um, but we will not, um, at, at this point, we have not found a pathway to uh, partner with police recognizing the relationship between community and police services. Um, so uh, there are rules at the hospital about police engagement and um, what we know is about 25% of our brave patients are justice involved. And, um, and so we will continue to provide supports for as long as we can um, while they are um, in community or in the hospital. Um, and unfortunately we lose touch with them should they uh, go into uh, the system, um, which is a, a, one of the reasons why I want to connect with this group because we would like to be able to continue that, that care pathway um, for the duration of the time that the patient needs help in, in their physical recovery, as well as um, coordinating um, with services while they're inside um, and reintegrating back into community. So maintaining that pathway and, and um, sort of a care circle. Um, we, we maintain a separate database for our, um, for our notes. Um, the Brave, brave um um, uh, case management system is separate from the, um, the medical records for the patients. So um, that's a product of um, needing to create a, a way to track information and collect data and uh, case management information effectively and efficiently 
um, within a, an antiquated uh, medical record system. So we weren't able to actually use the medical record system. Um, and we also were, it was recommended to us by uh, programs in the United States that we keep, keep our records separate. Um, yeah, so what gets documented is carefully um, um, crafted by our case managers. Another question, um, do you have city council support to find funds? Oh, oh, we've had tremendous support from from uh, uh, city council. Um, without it, we would not have funding in the first place. So city council, Toronto Public Health, um, and the, the safe TO um, um, uh, strategy. So we have we have collectively worked together um, to to support this program as well as thrive. Um, uh, again, I can't underscore how important the support from city council has been. Yes, in, in the, 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 the development, the launch and the support of the program. Um, so we work very closely and collaboratively with the city uh, on the towards peace programming, on all of the programming around violence intervention um, that the city has uh, has created. And um, yeah, they are our, our favorite people. Um, is there a percentage of inpatient and outpatient in the program? So everybody started as an inpatient. Um, at, well, let me say, uh, not everybody was admitted. So some injuries don't require admission. They get treated through the trauma program um, in a short period of time, and they might be discharged same day. Um, uh, but they have been a trauma activation. So that to scope into BRAVE, you need to be under the age of 30, treated in our trauma program uh, as a trauma activation. Uh, sometimes we will get referrals from our emergency department physicians, um, but gunshots and stabbings will usually uh, trigger uh, the trauma activation and uh, will be treated by our specialized team. Um, whether they are admitted or not, uh, they will be scoped in and then our, our um, a trauma services manager gets a report of all of the um, cases that were seen each each day and um, and he shares those to myself and our case managers and they um, they get seen as soon as possible. And if they've been all discharged already, then um, if, if we have a phone number, then uh, we'll reach out to them that way. Um, if they haven't left us a phone number, um, because sometimes people don't want to leave their personal information with the, the hospital. And um, we've also put up posters in our emergency department, as well as at Scarborough Health Network and at um, Humber River, that people can self-refer to our program. So it's a quick QR scan. Just give us um, a little bit of information and we'll reach out to you um, with a self-referral so they don't have to give their information to the hospital if they don't want. Also, in working with our community partners, if they are aware of somebody who's been treated at any of those three hospitals um, and they're under the age of 30, sorry, and treated for a gunshot wound or a stabbing wound, then um, uh, they can they can make a referral to us. So we, we've tried to cover off every potential pathway and, and try to cover off every possibility of losing a patient um, who hasn't left a phone number or, or their personal information to reach out to them. Um, but everybody has been uh, treated at one of those three hospitals. Thanks, Brandy. Just for sake of time, I'll leave one or two last questions. And thanks, folks, for all of your really great questions. <laughs> they were flooding in. Um, so... The one was, uh, has there been focus on engaging Indigenous communities? It, uh, not specifically, but but that is uh, that would definitely be um, something that we would want to do. Um, I know the hospital at large has done uh, uh, good work in that area. Um, and I'm just trying to, I'm thinking as I'm answering... The, the percentage of patients that we have seen have not, um, in fact, I'm not sure it, either in identity um, and how, how the patients are identified um, that it has come up. Um, but I'd have to look into that, but it's definitely um, something that we would need to uh, uh, look at. Yeah, the, the program is meant to be as inclusive as possible, um, recognizing uh, the patients that we see most frequently. Um, but that, that would be a gap, I would say at this point. Awesome. And last question, um, what's the criteria for being selected as a client for the program and do any potential clients turn down the opportunity to participate? Yeah, great question. Um, so the first part, sorry, repeat it if you can. I know we have one. So what's the criteria for being selected? Yeah. 
So every patient under the age of 30 who has been shot or stabbed as a result of community violence, so not intimate partner violence, not domestic violence, not family violence, um, is an automatic referral to our BRAVE program. The second part. <laughs> BRAVE's like a sieve today. No worries. Um, oh, and, and yeah. Do Some they people do decline. Yes, certainly. So depending on the ecosystem that the patient is involved in, they may have, you know, uh, two working parents, a loving household. It was a wrong place, wrong time. Uh, oftentimes that is the situation. Uh, they may be employed. Uh, they might be married. Um, they might have friends, family. They may not have mental health issues or substance um, issues. Um, and they feel really good about their opportunities for a healthy recovery. Um, and oftentimes those patients will decline service. Um, and sometimes patients will decline service who very much need it but they're just not ready to activate it. And so they might, they get a, a brochure and a business card and they can check in with us at any point uh, following their discharge and we will pick them up. I think that is all of our questions and we're right at one o'clock, but I, again, Brandy, right. I wanted to thank you so much for today's presentation and clearly uh, others uh, felt the same way that this is such an important program and is something that folks uh, hope continues to to get uh, to fund it and, and continue and uh, potentially try and, and spread and scale across the province for those programs. So uh, we look forward to connecting you further with HSJCC. I think there are a lot of connection points like there, like as you said, and I'm sure you'll have some folks reaching out uh, post webinar as well if more I questions come up. So yes, excellent. Thank you everyone for attending. And as we mentioned, the slides and uh, the recording will be up in a couple of days. But have a great rest of your day, and thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Thanks, Brandy. Take care.